Got a brand new ITL Grammy winner in the house. Strap in for the ride. It's Pensado's place. Did you say strap on? I wasn't paying attention. No, knobs are your specialty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, everybody knows about hey. your knob fixation. <laughs> Let's keep the show on a high level. 2012 yeah. started up. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I was like trying to think of my questions, and I'm like, did he say strap on? Um, you guys weren't here, but earlier Herb and I were teasing about pretending like we did ITL this week about strip club music, so it kind of all fit together. Anyway, good to have you guys here. Uh, man, last week was incredible. We're still buzzing about that ourselves. Uh, Alan was amazing, and uh, this week uh, pretends to be nothing less. Um, how's your week so far, Herb? You look good in that shirt, by the way. Thank you. Uh, oh, Canada. <laughs> so uh, it was a gift from a viewer, and I just felt like Following it up, but uh, but actually my week has improved dramatically in the last ten seconds because you use the word portends, it, mm. very well and very effectively too. So one of my degrees is in English, and evident by your use of genre. I'd be good with big words. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> precisely as we can tell. But anyways, good week. You know, back yeah. at it, back on yeah. the saddle, um, back in the saddle, as I should say. Yeah. Um, excited about what's coming. Um, you know, good guest as evidence bar guy here. Lots of I stuff. Know. Um, let's get the other stuff out of the way so we can get right to the meat of the things. Uh, our homework page, as you well know, there it is up on the screen, Facebook and Twitter and our YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. Um, you guys have been an amazing power for us in terms of stuff that's going on. We'll, we'll, we'll bring you up to date on all that stuff later. We, we don't want to do it every week, but we're constantly shocked at the power of, that you guys have and that you afford us. So thank you for all that. Um, Vintage King, as usual, what's up, VK? In the chat room is Darren Henley. Darren, and Darren's new. I don't know if Darren's new, but I think Darren came to MixFest. Anyways, but his... Oh, Darren. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His page is up there, and cool. he'll be in there answering your Good questions. Good to have you, Darren. Uh, actually, let me, make, let me correct this. Darren Fendley, not Henley. Uh, I was having an Eagles moment, and, you know, Boys of Summer. You, did, you only did 30 minutes. Of <coughs> you should have done about another 10 before the show. Yeah, exactly. Out, so right? Darren Finley's in there. And obviously our chat room is hosted by our ever-loving Drew Adams. There's Drew. What the deal? Drew. Uh, Drew's in eubonics class. And <laughs> <laughs> what the dealio. Uh, so, uh, listen, I think what we should do is get to ITLs and rock and roll. Man, let's do it. Herb, I mean... Uh, um, who's our, oh yeah, Will. He looks just like me. I know. <laughs> uh, I can't do it, Herb. I can't do it. Okay, I, I can't so do it. I was going to try to punt straight to ITL. I just can't do it. Okay, so what are you going to do? I have to, I have to go through some footnotes. Uh, this week's ITL is not uh, how to use a compressor. It's when. So, so don't expect any hows. It's just when. And uh, I just want to give you a little insight into my thought process, which I'm repeating everything I started off ITL with. But uh, anyway... And then we, when we come back from that, we're going to expand on some of those concepts with uh, our guest today. So enjoy. ITL. Hey, guys. Um, this week we're going to do um, a little bit of uh, maintenance, maintenance work. Uh, we've kind of gone over how to use compressors, um, some of the different techniques we use compressors. Uh, this week we're going to focus on entirely on when to use a compressor, what is the dis decision-making process that I use when or not to use a compressor. And uh, I originally thought this... Uh... Hey guys, um, this week we're going to do um, a little bit of uh, maintenance work. Uh, we've kind of gone over how to use compressors, um, some of the different techniques we use compressors. Uh, this week we're going to focus on entirely on when to use a compressor, what is the dis decision-making process that I use when or not to use a compressor. And uh, I originally thought this uh, is going to be a good one, pretty solid, might not be that interesting, but I kind of enjoyed it, so I hope you do too. The way I think, I, my mind kind of divides compressors up into two broad bands one of those bands having a, a bit of a subcategory. But I usually think of compressors as either to work with dynamics, tame, smooth out, whatever you want to call it, dynamics within a track in some way. Uh, that would be uh, 
also inclusive of, of things like bringing something to the front of the track, making it sit in the track. So that's, that's one of the ways I think about compression, when to use it. And then the other way I make a decision about compression is using it as an effect. For example, adding attack to the snare or increasing the attack on a vocal or, or, or like I'm going to show you today, increasing the attack on, a, on an acoustic guitar. I think of compression as here's my threshold, here's, here's my music levels. Now, when, when a music level goes above my threshold that I've set, let's say it goes above that threshold 10 dB, and, and I set my ratio at 2, then for every 10 dB above threshold, it knocks it down to 5. So, so instead of doing this, it goes half, and it goes like this. So we've lowered our overall level 5 dB, so now you take the gain knob and you crank that up 5 dB, and so what you've done in effect is you've moved the little troughs, like think of it as mountains, we've got about five metaphors going here, bear with me, think of it as mountains and valleys, you've now moved the valley up. The mountain stays where it is because of the gain control, you put that peak where it originally was with the gain control, and then the, the, the valley comes up. That's how we get things to, to sound like they're a little more up front, a little more in our face. Now don't go compressing every track, because if you do that, nothing's going to stick out. You're just going to, then you're going to start going, God, I can't, I can't separate the, uh, I can't hear this track over this track over this. Yeah, you killed all the dynamics, so your ear can't find it. So, so don't overuse compression. I, I, like I've said a hundred thousand times, I'm not a huge, huge fan of, comp of the way I use compression. Now when I hear other guys do it, the masters, I'm, I'm envious, but I don't feel like you have to use it. Another thing I get asked is, do I put equalizers before the compressors or after? Well, let's think about this. What What is an equalizer doing? It can either remove a frequency or add a frequency. So what is happening to the compressor if we've got like um, a lot of low frequency in, in our sound and we don't want that low frequency to be controlling the compressor as much, well we roll that out. So whatever you want to have feeding the compressor and have the compressor act on, you either add or remove and then uh, I find more often than not I put my equalizers after the compressor. But I'll do both a lot of times. A little bit of repair work in front of the compressor, a little bit of gaining back. If I lost some low end, I'll, 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 I'll gain it back after the compressor. You, you guys have seen my parallel chain on the kick drum and the snare. I, I, I sometimes add 10, 15 dB of, of, of 30, 40, 60 after the compressor, and I'm compressing a lot. Like, I'll, I'll be knocking off 12 dB, so I'm losing a lot of low end. Okay, guys, I'm going to show you this vocal uh, because I think it, 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 it illustrates a lot, of, a lot of things, and I'm going to use some compressors that we all use. I'm going to use Renaissance uh, by Waves because it's pretty popular. Uh, everybody has it. It's you know, it's a desert island compressor, you know, it's one of those things, if you had one compressor on a desert island, it would be that one, um, in the plug-in world. Okay, here's the vocal. I'll be your strength, I'll be, I'll be your strength. Okay, you hear your and strength kind of jump up. I'll be is kind of down a little bit. Now, if this was him and an acoustic guitar, I probably wouldn't change too much of that, but he's going to be competing with a lot of stuff in the track. So let's see if we can bring the I'll be up and the your strength down. I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll. I'm sure you heard that. It's, this is pretty dramatic. Um, now, remember our little example about the mountain top and the valleys. We took and we lowered the mountain top. Then we put the mountain top back where it was, but as we brought it up, we brought the valley up. So we, we kind of kept your strength about normal, and we brought up the I'll be. Okay, now let's try what happens with a, uh, doing the same thing, but with more of a limiting. So essentially the same thing. This is, this is the, the rap squash preset. This preset right here. Is, I use this on everything all the time. Okay, here's with it. 
I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll be. We actually get a little tiny bit of low end from that, and and and. Gosh, I don't know which one I like best. I I think I like. If I wanted the vocal to stay constantly in my face, I'd use this version of. Uh, I would I would use a, a higher ratio and go more towards limiting. If I wanted the vocal to still have a little emotion and 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 have a couple of words that were ducking down a little bit and a couple of words that weren't, I'd use um, I'd use the other compressor. Now, an, an alternate thing is is um, is to use the the other compressor. And uh, use an old buddy of mine, vocal writer. Watch this. I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll be your. So there's other techniques too. This is kind of compression, but instead of doing it with electronics detecting the signal and processing that, it's it's actually writing levels in a different way. Real cool plug-in. Okay, now uh, I want you to hear this. Um, this is the Shadow Hills compressor. This is an analog compressor. Um, and um, now this this gives us a little color, gives us compression. It kind of, it, it's kind of a, a it does, it does everything. It does, the, it adds an effect and it adds compression. And this is, this has become one of my favorite compressors. Be, I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll be your strength. I'll be, I'll now. be your strength. I'll be, I'll be there. your strength. I'll be, I'll be your strength. I'll be. So that's another option. Incredible. I got the, I got the threshold set a little low on that, but you can get the idea. Okay. Um, now let's go to let's go to an acoustic guitar. Now this is another way to compress. Now everything that we did on that vocal applies applies to the acoustic. Now this guitar, as you can tell, is pretty compressed. So what I'm doing is I'm using uh, this uh, UAD and I'm getting my compression right here. Watch this little light. Well, let me play it for you without it. As you can see, we don't really need to compress that, but we're going to compress it. We're going to mess with the attack. So that's what we're trying to mess with. And we're going to do it not just with compression, but I, I, I've added some widening and some top end, but you'll see how it all works together. My compression. Without it. Okay, guys, so uh, we're going to come back to this subject in the future because uh, we keep getting a lot of questions about this. Compression seems to be the one consistent question we get. Now, I didn't go into stereo bus because we've covered you know, stereo bus compression and how to listen for it and all that. We, we've covered that several times already. So, um, just just uh, just to reiterate, when you sit down, have a reason to to pull up a compressor, and then and then try and listen in your head and picture what you want it to do, and then go try to achieve that sound. It might take you 30 minutes the first time, and then after four or five years, it'll take you three seconds because you'll already have that in your brain. By the way, guys, I don't know if you ever saw, but. Um, Oh, National Geographic Channel had a show on the brain. It's called Brain Games. If you ever get a chance to watch those, uh, there's a lot that can be applied to the world of audio in those. Okay, guys, I'll see you in a little bit. All right, guys. Um, first of all, good to see Bill Kamick in there. And, and Alex, spell your name phonetically on the chat board. Alex, neat, so I can get it right next time. Guys, I'm really excited to have Peter Mokren with us today. Peter is someone who's work I've admired for a long time. Someone, uh, he's an engineer's engineer, and uh, we work on a lot of the same records, and I'm, I'm always scared. First thing I do is play 
his mix on the record and mine, and he cleans my clock every time. So great to have Peter here. Peter, good to have you, my friend. Thank you. Thank welcome, you, Dave. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Peter, um, like we were talking earlier, I think you're the perfect guest because you do everything. Like like yeah. most of the guys at home, they have to write the, they write the song, they track it, they program it, they engineer it. You've had incredible success as a writer. You've written hit records. You've had incredible, you know, on and on and on. You, you started out, like a lot of people don't know this herb, but he, he programmed and played all those R. Kelly hits, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, when I say all of them, I mean the good ones. Mm -hmm. And um, engineered them, mixed them. Um, got his, I, I think got you, his lunch. Yeah, I was, about to try, I, was, I was looking for a joke there somewhere. So man, you're the perfect guest, you know, because that's, that's, that's our guys. Um, um, start me off by, let's go way, way back. Aaliyah is someone that's just captured all our hearts and imaginations. You did her entire first album. Uh, just give me a quick anecdote about that. Robert R. Kelly was, was fresh and new, and we were working in Chicago. It must have been an incredible experience. Yeah, she was actually, um, I think she's Gladys Knight's niece. Yeah. So, uh, originally, uh, we became aware of her, Robert's manager at the time, Barry Hankerson, mm -hmm. um, Ex-husband. Ex-husband of Gladys Last Knight. Night. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, wow, we're going way back. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, made us aware of, of Aaliyah, I guess. I don't know if she was on Star Search or, or something initially, but Gladys kind of took her under her wing. And Gladys had a deal at MCA, like an imprint. So we did a demo when she was, gosh, she was like 12 or 13 years old. Mm. And then uh, I think it was a couple of years later that, that she got the deal through, through Jive. And, uh, you know, at that point, R. Kelly's thing had kind of exploded. So, um, you know, she was the, the first artist, you know, that he kind of was going to produce and, you know, they were going to set up a label, and which they eventually did. Mm. Um, but it was incredible. I mean, she was so young at the time and just had an incredible work ethic. I mean, I know we were probably violating child labor laws or something <laughs> because, I mean, she would like, she would sit at the mic and, you know, I mean, it'd be like six hours went by and she hadn't left or even moved, you know, just going over stuff mm -hmm. over and over and over because initially when we first started working with her, she had a completely different vocal style, you know, she was kind of like the star search, like full voice belting it out. Mm -hmm. And it, it was good, you know, she sounded good, but, you know, um, it wasn't as unique as her sort of airy, mm -hmm. softer tone. Um, so a lot of that was sort of developing it. You know, we initially did like a whole record that never came out, you know, kind of a different direction until, you know, mm -hmm. kind of found, you know, found her thing. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, from then it, it went really quick. Don't 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 let me forget about your work with Michael Jackson on on history and uh, uh, the Pussycat Dolls. Uh, I hate this part. That was a, that was an incredible mix. I know the I know the struggle you went through that too. And uh, there's several records that you've done that, that people should know about. And we'll get into those as we go along. Flaming Lips is a, a little a little yeah, just different. a classic. But when you bring all these hats to the table, I don't. I, I, while we're while we're reminiscing that skit on Living Color, the 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 Jamaican family, you know, like you only got one job, you know, it's like <laughs> like when you bring all these skills to the table, how how does it how is it an asset? And like the guys at home that have to do this, what what advice would you give to them in terms of of wearing so many hats at the same time? Do do, do you find it, it it reduces the the creativity, or because you don't you, you, there's no safety net for yourself? You know, I mean. No, I mean, I, into you that. know, I think at the time, you know, I was young. I wasn't really thinking of specific, you know, jobs, and mm -hmm. really even just mixing. You know, I wasn't even aware that there was a guy that only did that. You know, <laughs> me too. Possibility. Me too. Yeah. So really, it was just. Um, you know, there's so many guys that, that do it. Having a, a, a niche where you can you can fit in, where you can bring something else to the table. You know, so for example, you know, if somebody's working on something and it's like, oh, we need a guitar part, and you can play guitar. I mean, it only ups your you know ups mm -hmm. your stock as an engineer or mm -hmm. whatever other profession. And you know, nowadays, you know, with people working at home, every everybody everybody is is wearing all the hats. So. Mm -hmm. 
you know, the better you get at that, you know, if you start to collaborate with somebody else, you know, it's, it's just another skill set to, to bring Do you ever to feel it. like, man, I wish I, I wish I could get an opinion on this, you know, because you're having to engineer your own work, and do you ever, like, when I, when I, when I do it, I always feel like I've got to ask somebody, is this good? Because I, I, I lose focus about good or bad because I did it. I think it's great, or I think it's horrible. It's never in between. Yeah, I mean, I find that the... Uh, the things I've you know produced or done from the ground up. When I go to mix it, I'm I'm more precious with it than than when I get hired to mix someone's stuff. And I almost think I'm worse mixing my own stuff than somebody else's. Be too close to it. You know, well, yeah, too close to it exactly. Because you think like, oh man, this guitar was a you know this was played on a '57 right. Strat you know. Right. Hand of God guitar with these special strings, and yeah. I used a pick made out of butterfly wings. You know, I'm not. I don't dare. I don't dare EQ. I'm not. I don't I dare don't EQ that. this sound. I'm not gonna. Touch. Whereas, you know, if I got it and didn't know, it'd be like, oh, this guitar is really dull. You know, yeah, you go exactly. in there and it's like, exactly. you know, go for it. So, um, hmm. by the way, I don't know what my point is, but, <laughs> but, no, but I can, yeah. once once you hit butterfly wings, the show could be over there. <laughs> um, Guys, uh, Sound on Sound, 2009, somewhere in there, uh, he talks about a record he did. Uh, the artist is called, um, uh, well, Nicole is the artist from, from Pussycat Dolls, uh, our, our friend from uh, X Factor. And uh, he breaks down in the article a lot of interesting things that he does. Um, there's a little bit of a, even though it's a couple of years old, he's, he's using more plugins now, so we won't hold everything he said in that article against him. Um, another one of your records, the Lisa Stansfield record, Never Gonna Give You Up. Mm -hmm. Like, like, y you, you hear reverb differently than, than a lot of us do. Like, like, I've always thought that the way you use empty holes and spaces in your mixes is about as good as it gets. You don't try to fill every empty space up. You, 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 you let the empty spaces amplify the other part what was, on, on, on some of your big hits, how do you make the decision on how to treat those spaces? Like, like, like sometimes it seems like your reverb decays different amounts into different holes. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm, I'm constantly changing it, so there isn't a static, you know, reverb. I'm always riding it, you know, throughout the song. But uh, the other thing I try to do is, you know, so you, you look at, you know, this song and there's lots of parts and keyboards and guitar so there's a lot of space that's filled so then, you know you put up this amazing sounding reverb and you try to throw it in there and then it, it's either like you don't hear it or there's too much of it so what I try to do is I'll make a separate s send that I'm EQing so I'm EQing it all the time whereas um, by itself it might sound a little strange like mm -hmm. I may pull all the low end out of it mm -hmm. and just use the e you know the reverb to, to try to you know, try to fill the holes and and try to um, you know add around it rather than it's very rarely just you know full frequency um, effect. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is a lot of times I'm sending it from a delay, so you get you get a little bit of a different thing up front and then a, a you know like a different kind of wash behind it. Is that is that why some of, some of your records to me just as a listener and as a consumer, there's a there's a smoothness to your records. No loss of pocket, yeah. but just kind of a smooth thing where everything is in balance in such a way that I call it driving music. You just want to put it on yeah. and just kind of roll with it. Is it some is some of that your technique? Yeah, I mean I'm I'm sensitive to, you know, having it having it be harsh, but mm -hmm. most of it is, you know, like I I I EQ all of my effects returns mm. and the send as well mm. and then the send is not a static thing and the return is not a static thing ah, so I'm see. kind of I'm kind of writing it that's what that's what just like in a, in a song where the drum levels tend to stay the same because they're programmed that's how you get that, that yeah I'm writing, a live it, I'm writing everything all the time just to try to get some dynamics is the uh, is the 2016 you, would you say that's your go-to reverb that even yeah yeah I use the 2016 up front and then I'll use like an EMT 250 behind it, just a, a little bit of it. Oh, so. my two favorite. EMT was the first one I used. Yeah. Uh, the, the good fellows at Even Tide just sent me a new version of the 2016 that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I can't wait to try that on a record. Um, when do you, when and why do you 
And how do you choose, and are there any other adverbs I can throw in there, Harold? <laughs> a Canadian one somewhere? You yeah. still got that stripper glitter right there. Thank you. It's red. It's to match your something about Mary Harris. <laughs> <laughs> that was in the idea. <laughs> so we'll talk about that well, another time. <laughs> uh, you, you called me, I didn't have that much to say on ITL, so I was trying to distract from the fact that I said and nothing you, in 10 minutes of any were, usable form or, or fashion. And you were completely effective. Good. <laughs> so, well, enjoy it while you can, because I'm well, thinking he, about... He, he does have his organic, you know, can holding up the uh, speaker. Yeah. So what's a more yeah. more organic hair gel than it's, it's precise, that, right? So well, it, well put. It, it housed eco-friendly paint. That's a green. We're as the show is totally a green show. My studio is totally green. All of the power is coming from about four thousand hamsters on the little wheels there out there. Go. So it's a totally green show. Alrighty. So so my question was. <laughs> When I, uh, I, I, Herb's going to bitch slap me here because I, I can't stop myself. I have to do this. When I pick a pre-delay, I try to pick a, a number that's going to hide the reverb behind a beat. So like I'll, I'll pick a 16th or an 8th. And I like long pre-delays mostly for vocals. How, what's your process for choosing a pre-delay? Is it, of course, it would be dependent on an instrument, right? Yeah, I, I, I kind of do the same thing. I mean, I'll have, uh, I'll have a couple short you know, ones in stereo, usually like around a sixteenth, and then I'll have one that's not exactly on beat that I'm feeding to the verb. Mm -hmm. um, I learned that from Ron Fair. <laughs> he probably got it from you, huh? I don't know. <laughs> um, but yeah, just so when everything's exactly on the beat, you know, then you know, almost you almost don't hear it as well, especially if mm -hmm. it's going to just be sent to a reverb anyway. You're not getting as mm -hmm. much of the delay. It's more of a a different color. You know, so it isn't just the mm -hmm. the vocal exactly the way the vocal is EQ'd going to a reverb. Gotcha. Um, sometimes that kind of blends in, whereas I might send it to like a dirtier delay, and then from that feed the reverb. So it, it has like a little different character. Let's let's divide this next question into two parts. Why am I using my hands <laughs> a lot it's today? Two parts. You're going to divide it. Um, <laughs> um, Let's say let's divide into how you would do it with a rap record and how you do it with a pop record. But when would you choose delays over reverbs in a rap record? What would like like if if well like rap rap record not really using reverb. Um, so your go-to would be a delay. Go-to would be you know a few short delays and uh, with with some regeneration, so you almost get like that spring reverb kind of an mm -hmm. effect. I mean that's a little extreme, but um, I try to get it. I try to get it without reverb. If I am going to use a verb, it would be more like a non-linear, something oh, okay. that doesn't, basically the spill over, you know, especially if it's any kind of faster, mm -hmm. you know, sort of rap, um, it, it kind of washes it out a little bit. So and on a pop record, what pop, would you... Pop record would be, would be the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, especially if it's like a ballad or something like that, you're almost looking to extend some of the phrases so they kind of roll over into each other. Um, Gives you that smooth driving music. Yeah, you <laughs> so, so in that case, you'd be using you'd be using the pre-delay to help create a, a rhythmic vibe as opposed to create a space for. Yeah, and and using delays that also feed reverbs. So, uh -huh. um, you know, you, you'd ha I could have a series of delays like sixteenth, you know, eighth quarter, um, even even half note. That you know, rather than just being the delay, they also might feed a longer verb, so you, you get a taste of the delay, and you know, let's so it'd be 50% would be the delay, but the other 50% would be the delay going to the reverb. Uh, you and I both work, work a lot with Ron Fair. It seems like I wasn't using slaps too much for about 10 years, and then about seven years ago, Ron started requesting other slaps, and I fell yeah. in love with it again. Are you, are you are, are that 80 to 120 millisecond right. range? Are you still, because I know you work with Ron, but yeah. are you still using a lot of that? Oh, yeah. I, I just can't get it out of my yeah, head yeah, after Ron great. reintroduced it's, us yeah, to it. Yeah. When, um, when do you choose limiting over compression? Is that something that can be delineated, delineated easily? Um, yeah, for me, because I hardly ever use limiting. I mean, okay. the, the only time really is like, uh, you know, if I want to dirty up some drums, you know, like running a kick through an L2 till it distorts or something, mm -hmm. you know, you can, you can kind of get a thing with it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I don't have a lot of luck with, you know, like limiting. Um, mm -hmm. In, in general, uh, do you keep your 
do you keep your ratios on your compression? Do you keep them like four, six, eight, or do you do you ever go up to the limiting areas like no, 30, 40? No, usually, usually a little bit lower. Like I, I would rather compress it a little bit more with a, a lower ratio mm -hmm. um, if I'm if I'm trying to get the sound of it. Is um, that mostly with vocals or all instruments? That that philosophy. Pretty much all instruments. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't I don't really put a limit. I mean. You know, it's not true. There's always the, the rare case where something, there might be such an extreme mm -hmm. level thing or something. But usually I'll try to ride, I'll try to ride it rather than just, mm -hmm. you know, nuke it with a limiter. But there, there are times mm -hmm. where, where nothing else seems to uh, do when it. When I was kind of thinking about some questions for you, it popped into my mind that because so many people have access to, to great tools, plugins in particular, we don't need to compress as much as we used to. I find, like, a lot of times I'm using a two two to one ratio and, yeah. and barely need, need, needing any compression. In fact, one of the examples I showed in ITL, I really didn't need to compress it at all. I just did it because it... Cause yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's a funny thing. Some, some guys do really great with, you know, a mix and then, you know, they'll have the, the needle really, really dancing even, even on the overall mix. But uh, it doesn't really work for me. I, I would, I, I rather kind of blend it differently. If that makes sense, yeah, you know, um, it makes total sense. Yeah. Sometimes, do you ever find yourself where 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 you compress the major elements in the track so much that you find you're riding the fader more, and then you go instead of just riding the fader, let me just uncompress the, something. Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a period where I would, you know, make a drum bus and then kind of slam the drums, you know, in like I'm already compressing them, then sending them to a bus and mm -hmm. mixing that underneath and. You know, it, it's kind of cool if you're when you're in solo, you know, just listening to the drums. But mm -hmm. then, you know, I, I kind of listened to it after a few months of doing that and just stopped. And it was just, it was just, you know, for me, it, it was just better. I mean, you know, there, there's so many ways to, to, to do it to skin a cat that, yeah. you know, I mean, I may say one thing. Well, you know, the reason, you know, somebody might hear something I do and, and think it sounds really compressed, but, you know... I might just be riding it different, whereas mm -hmm. somebody else can get the same thing with yeah. with just using a compressor and not having to ride it. But for me, um, the less uh, the less compression, the better. Yeah, guys, remember that he made a great point. When I first started engineering, I was shocked at how people got the same thing I got from two completely different ways. So everything you hear on Pensada's place, take as as a suggestion, not a hard and fast way to do something, and then then you'll be a a first-rate who you are instead of a second-rate Peter Mokren. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's a really good point because <clears throat> when I started out, you know, there were things I was trying to mimic and it actually led me to my own thing and, and there, was a, there was one instance it was like a Mick Guzowski on a, oh. jo on a Jodeci vocal and I was absolutely convinced I knew exactly what he was doing and then I met him uh -huh. and he was, he wasn't, I mean, he wasn't even in the ballpark. I wasn't even <laughs> close, but, yeah. you know, so. Some of you guys that aren't familiar with Mick, uh, go back and look up some of his early Mariah Carey records there. Mick's one of the all-time greats, but the top end on those vocals, part of that mm -hmm. is Mariah. Uh, I mixed Touch My Body, uh, and, and part of it's just her. She's got all that breath, but, man, what Mick does with vocals. When you worked on uh, history with Michael Jackson, you wore a lot of hats in that project. Um, is there something that stands out to you that, 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 that did, like on the on Michael's vocals? What did you do? Um, well, it was cool because I got to I got to record. You know, you are not alone, and mm -hmm. and do the mix. Um, and uh, just I used. It was really interesting. I used what Bruce used. 1176. Uh, no, no, he was using the the Neve um, 2254, a square oh, box. I always thought he used an 1176 on they, Michael. Yeah, they, they switched it up. They switched it up. I even used they even used the old uh, 165 occasionally. The DBX one. Yeah. The over easy compressor. Yeah, yeah. So if he was if he was belting it back then, they'd use an SM7 and the 165, 1176 sometimes. But Michael was incredible, man. I mean, he could hear the difference between two identically set up compressors. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you forget. That was the thing that blew me away was just his, you know, his chops was, you know, I mean, his audio chops were incredible. Um, wow. You know. Wow. Yeah. Mm. Um, 
One, one of the, I mean, yeah, he was, he was just oh, one of the all-time greats. Yeah, I, I remember when I went to uh, do, do the mix. You know, it's like a slow kind of ballad, and it just, it just wasn't feeling right. I, I kept asking, you know, we were on tape machines back then. Yeah. Kept asking if the speed was playing back right. It's kind of pulling my hair out, until I put the vocal in, and you know, he he would insist recording in a in a big room, not a booth on a wooden floor. Mm -hmm. And he was um, what you're talking about earlier, your bracelet. Mm -hmm. He was just kind of dancing around, and you could, you know, it was real subtle. It was mm -hmm. in there, but the vocal mic, you know, was picking up all his little rhythmic movements, and it was mm -hmm. almost like a little loop mm -hmm. that was kind of wow. pushing. Yeah pushing the record and then then it felt great again wow. you know just as you would do you'd start a mix yeah. and you, you know you worked on it you know you kind of mute the vocal yeah. and amazing yeah i mixed amazing. Uh, definitely i mixed hollywood tonight not not the album version sean marie did that i did the remix and uh when i had his vocal out i was stunned that there was that much rhythmic thing going on that i couldn't hear in the track yeah. um something that that those that follow the show regularly know is, is from time to time I just get totally confused about stereo bus compression. Can you yeah. enlighten me on your process? Oh, and I, I want to make another point real quick, Peter. Uh, you, you actually programmed that song, uh, uh, You're Not Alone. You actually did the programming. I mean, yeah. you did damn near everything on that song. I, I kind of started out as a programmer that, that was, you know, that, that, that was my initial, you know, way to get work. What's your main <laughs> instrument? Guitar, piano? Guitar. Okay. Yeah. All the great engineers are guitar players. Have you <laughs> noticed that? Um, how, uh, one of the things plays a mean guitar. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks. One of the things I struggle with constantly is knowing when I'm done. Um, when I work at Larrabee, I know when I'm done because they tell me get the hell out. Right. Um, <laughs> the clock is right. <laughs> I'm trying to train my wife to do the same thing for me right. in my project studio when I work at that one. And then, and then, uh, Drew is of absolutely no help. He like Drew will stay there f 15 days if he can. He loves it. How do you know when? Because he's getting paid. By the hour. <laughs> How do you know when you're done? Like not 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 necessarily on a mix, but let's say you're 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 EQing a vocal or you're you're EQing the main part of a track. How do you know when you're done? Man, I, I wish you could tell me. I, I, it's a, you know, it's a it's a struggle. Obviously. Having a deadline is not necessarily a, a bad thing, you know what you know yeah. Herb alluded to, you know, having having the like, well, I can't EQ this vocal for two hours right. because I gotta I gotta get there's some something to be mm -hmm. said about you know, limits. And I think um, it helps focus you guys' artistry sometimes. When you yeah. know you have that, you're like, you know, I gotta get to it, mm -hmm. I gotta call out the decision making process mm -hmm. and I've gotta have an end game because and particularly with so much technology available yeah. to you, you guys can go forever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to compare us to what we do to great art, but creativity is creativity. And you, you, you know in your heart that Michelangelo would still be painting the Sistine mm -hmm. Chapel if the Pope hadn't pulled the plug, you know. Yeah. And there's just something. And what I'm noticing, tell me if this is true for you, I'm noticing that when I, when I spend too much time on one track, I end up coming back to it anyway and undoing a good 50% of what I thought I was killing the world with and about ready to call Mix Magazine for an interview about this incredible thing I just did. And then two hours later, I undo all of that because it didn't fit the track quite right yeah. or something. I mean, I just wish I knew when enough was enough and then move on, you know? Like, you gotta do enough. If it's, like a, it's, like, it's like a sculpture, Herb, where in your mind, you're seeing a big block of marble you want to see what the face looks like, so you try to knock off enough marble to where a face is starting to appear, mm -hmm. but you can't go straight for, to make the eyes perfect until you get the face kind of outlined. It's, it's, it's a constant struggle in your mind that when to stop, and, but you've got to do enough to know what you've got. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm str I struggle with the same thing, but I, I think it's, you know, if it's a situation where you're working in solo, is turn the turn the dang solo off because yeah. you know you can Don't solo work. a bass and then you know there's never enough low end. When when do you when would you ever stop? You you know you, you keep you know you <laughs> put six plugins and you know. Uh -huh. But when you know when you're hearing it in, in the track, then then you, you at least you have that a little more of a of a reference. Yeah, the thing that screwed me up was Alan Myerson was my inspiration for getting into my 
into mixing. He was also my inspiration for thinking about quitting because the first time I saw him work, I was like, I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, he just touches it and it's done. Mm. I mean, like when I say done, I mean, it's done. And I, I always thought that I was inadequate because I didn't have that gift, you know? Well, everybody, you know, everybody comes to the same point differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, getting back to the stereo bus, what 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 what's your approach to that? Um, I my I guess my approach is um, trying to uh, maybe impart some other sort of touch of a vibe. Like I, I'll use this Fairman compressor. It's not really a compressor, but it kind of it kind of takes the top end harshness off a I'm little bit. I'm not familiar bit. with that. Is it a tube? It's a tube thing. It, it started out, they were originally marketing it as like another Fairchild, but it's, it's really not that at all. Um, and it's, it's made by a guy in Denmark. It's really like high-end components. You know, you can, you can unlink the, the compression and it, it still matches perfectly. It's all really... F-A-I-R-M-A-N, I believe. Is yeah, fair, as in Ron Fair, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'll use that just to just to to kind of it almost widens the mix a little bit. Did you use that on that Queen Latifah record? Yeah. You did. yeah. Guys, he did a record on Queen Latifah, um, Poetry Man, off of the, her singing album. The, the 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 mix was so incredible that uh, Bernie Grumman didn't even master it. They just went from his console straight to the record and. That's a good example of your use of space and reverbs. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's not a banging record, but, it, but it's subtle enough to where I think people can pick out the... Yeah, yeah, it's a jazz record, but you can definitely hear a little bit of that, you know, what the, what the Fairman yeah. does. I was shocked it. Latifah can sing that oh, well. Yeah. She's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. incredible. Um, well, man, uh, I, I, I'm, I've, I've learned more in 30 minutes than I have in... Three years. It's been a, been a good couple of weeks of um, between between Alan and him. I'm I'm I could have a career. Stop. Sure. <laughs> Freeze it in time and call today. <laughs> Why don't we tee up some batter's box? Man, I, I, I'm ready. Peter, um, you wanna you wanna make batter's box about effects or EQs sure. or, or whatever you wanna do. Okay, um, plugins when you can. You know. So, um, lead vocals? Uh, 2016. Okay. Plug in or. <laughs> Background vocals? Uh, EMT 250. Wow. Uh, acoustic guitar? Uh, EMT plate. Okay. Uh, a rap lead vocal? Um, Marshall tape eliminator. Holy cow, we gotta come back to that. <laughs> Piano, uh, acoustic piano. Um, 2016. Okay. Uh, synthesizer strings, because most of our guys don't have access to a $60,000, $100,000 orchestra. Yeah, I'd say uh, 480L. Oh, okay. Yeah. Like a hall, a plate? No, it's, it's something short. Okay. Yeah. Uh, bass, guitar, bass synth. Bass synth, um, Publison. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst piece of gear I ever, ever. used. <laughs> Sounds incredible, but every time you touch it, it goes to German <laughs> or French. I can't keep mine from being in French or German. Um, electric guitar. Electric guitar. Um, I'd, I'd say the uh, Echo Farm. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, that's a great plug in. Yeah. Um, okay, um, program kick, like a, rig, like a, not a live kit, but a, uh, a kick drum this program. Sample. Yeah, I would, don't really use any reverb. May, maybe like a non-lin, something, something really, really short. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna digress, Herb. Don't, don't, don't bitch slap me. When you get kick drums in stereo, do you keep them in stereo or do you pan them in a little? Usually, I'll take a mono unless there's some room thing happening with it or, or some reason. Yes. Did you hear that, Drew? Yeah. Well, yeah. Good. Thanks. <laughs> uh, program snare. Um. RMX, AMS. Am ambient setting? Uh, yeah, but really short, shorter oh, okay. with pre-delay. Okay. Uh, oh man, that was so fast. I'm, I, I was, <laughs> that was... Uh, Maximum efficiency. <laughs> man. Which leaves Drew time to tee up a few. But he cheated. He said, he said 2016 and 250. 
So he can't get best ever award, but we'll give him Close. third place. Third place. <laughs> Close on that score. Okay. okay. Absolutely. Uh, team up, Drew. Cool, cool. Uh, questions from the corner office forward. Let, uh, let's start with Peter. Kessler Audio, question for Peter. How did you approach the guitars on the Emancipation album? Uh, that, that's a good one. <laughs> well, it's Prince, so it's, uh, it's pretty much the way he wants it. Um, yeah. I, what was on the record was what percentage of what you were given? Oh, all of it. I mean, it, it, was, it was really odd because what he, what he would do is, I mean, I don't know if it was just, you know, the tracks I was working on, or, or, but basically he recorded tons of tracks, you know, of, say, eight-bar segments, but it wasn't arranged. So this bass line could be the bridge, could be the chorus, could be the verse, wow. could be the, there was no, there was no telling, right? Wow. So um, I think he wanted to, you know, just get some fresh ideas or, or see what somebody else would, would put together, but it was really difficult for me because the, the communication was really low, so at first mm -hmm. I didn't really, I you didn't know what, he, what he wanted me to do. It was wow. like, wait a minute, you know, you've got two different, three different bass parts, wow. which is it, right? Yeah. So. Um, he does that when I worked with him. He, he did the same thing with vocals. It's almost like he just sang it real high, real low, real breathy, real this, and then you, then at some point he just, he just said, just use them all. But these were actually different parts. I mean, oh, they were like different, different changes, and it was like this could be a bridge, wow. but it plays from the beginning to the end. This could be a verse, but it plays from the beginning to the end. This could be a chorus, yeah, you know, a music. That's you. cool yeah. that he that he trusts you that much yeah, to make those well, decisions. I mean, I mean that, that that's where being a musician and a producer and a programmer comes in. Not too many people could handle that. Drew, I want to do another one, but real quickly, just your what's your personal musical taste? Is it what you mix, or do you listen to different things? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I'm I'm all over the map. Yeah. You know, I'll right right now I'll just have the jazz station tuned in. Gotcha. Um, but I I love you know R and B, classic soul. Gotcha. Um, but also rock. Gotcha. Um, so. Oh, yeah. cool. Yes I is the a, answer. I kind of <laughs> feel like I the band. Sense. Yes. There you go. That's a roundabout. <laughs> there you go. Go ahead, Drew. Right, cool. Uh, another one for Peter from Two Radic. Uh, what is it, what is an efficient way to learn programming? How and where to start? Oh, good question. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's different now than when I started. You know, when I started, we had the very first Macintosh <laughs> with a tiny screen, and there was one. It was the opcode sequencer. They hadn't even named it. <laughs> became Vision. Now, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's so many options, but, I mean, they all, they're all so good. I mean, you look at what GarageBand can do yeah. compared to what we had. For reason. You know, it, 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 there's, there's no answer. It's, it's whatever you've got. And, and right. I think... There's a lot to be said about that too. You know, early on, there were limitations. You know, you didn't have, you know, ten thousand like Fender Rhodes sounds to, to choose from. You know, you know, you had one good one and you made it work, and, and you really learned the box you had. You learned how to, That's critical. you know, mess learned with the, the parameters to, to get the sound you needed. Now, I mean, the options are are just endless. I I would say, I would say. You know, spend some time and get your little toolbox together with, you know, your three go-to piano sounds, your whatever, and then really learn how to manipulate those and, and start that way rather than just endlessly, you yeah. know, Can, can I interject sounds. something? Uh, I can, because it's my show. Yes, you can. Um, <laughs> think, of the, think of the layers of an onion. All the modern sequences are designed. You can walk up, turn it on, and use it. And then as you need more advanced features, you go to the next layer and the next layer. Don't expect to learn it in one day. Expect to learn it in a year, two years. And, and as you need something, call your buddies, go to YouTube, watch Pensada's Place. I'll put Peter Mokren's personal phone number on the website later. Call him. But find ways to learn it yourself. It's, it, 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 if you love doing music, you'll learn it without even remembering you learned it. Drew, one more. Yeah, I got one more. Uh, from Ian Michael Fafford. Uh, for Dave and, and Peter, uh, like with delay times, do you ever calculate release times on bus compression based on song tempo? Call me crazy, but I feel like it can help some grooves stay in the pocket a little tighter. Yeah, I mean, if you're using a lot, you know, the, the, the sort of when the levee breaks, mm -hmm. John Bonham thing, uh, you know, the, all that's the, the right release time for, mm -hmm. for what's being played. So, um, 
yeah, if you're you, if you're really compressing a lot mm -hmm. on on drums, it's it's critical. You mm -hmm. can if it's if it's too quick, it's you know mm -hmm. it can eat the next beat, if yeah. it, or too slow, I should say. Yeah. Uh, uh, what was his name again, Drew? Ian Michael Fafford. Uh, Ian, check out the Jack Joseph Puig um, interview. He talks a lot about using compression for groove making. Uh, part of the problem about putting the release time in time is uh, there's no there's no scale, so you have to use your your hearing and your ear to do it, and you end up guys like Peter end up getting it perfect without having uh, a, a digital readout of what the delay time is. But good question. Listen. Pleasure to have you at the table, man. Enjoyed it. You having fun? Yeah. It goes fast, huh? That it's can't be an hour. It <laughs> is. It is. It is. What a pleasure. Likewise. Friends off camera. Yeah. It's even great to have it's you great. on camera, yeah, for Peter, sure. thanks so much, man. Thank you, Dave. Uh, You'll come back? I'm come back. Great. Cool. Yeah. Cool, 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 cool. Guys, um, there's there's some guests we have on that, that, that there's things you learn from in this area, things you learn from in that area. Peter's a cat that go study his records and, and, and you'll be a better mixer. He, he, he does it all and he does it all incredibly well. It's not, just, it's not just doing it that's important, it's doing it right. And the way he integrates all of those responsibilities and hats is about as musical as it gets. Uh, when I think of a mixer that scares me, I, I, I think of Peter as being musical like the technical part he he got that a long long time ago he's transcended that so far and and and, and he makes his like herb said he, he feels something when he listens to peter so uh not to blow too much smoke up his ass but study that element of of, of his of his work and and and, and incorporate that in your skill set and we'll see you next week <laughs>